one of the things Keith is always, always, always hammering is language, history, context, language, history, context. Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Voices. I'm here today with Rabbi Dr. David Moster, who is a PhD from bar Ilan University. He has rabbinical ordination from Yeshiva University, and he's the director of the Institute of Biblical Culture, which is biblicalculture.org. Shalom, David. I'm also joined by Nelson Calvillo, who is a research assistant at the Institute of Hebrew Bible Manuscript Research. Shalom, Nelson. Guys, thanks for joining me. Today, we're going to do SBL reactions. I'm excited. <laughs> David, before we get started, tell us about your Institute of Biblical Culture. What is that? So thanks for asking. I'm the director of the Institute of Biblical Culture, which mostly means that I've been teaching a lot of biblical Hebrew. Hmm. I teach biblical Hebrew classes. They start every few months. And what we basically do, Nehemiah, is we start with the alphabet, the alphabet. People who know absolutely nothing, you could know stuff. It's not a, it doesn't preclude you. But if you know absolutely nothing, you can come join, study the Olivet. And by the end of one year, in 10 months, we read the entire book of Ruth in Hebrew. Wow. And the students give their own translation. Wow. So it's like, it goes from, it goes from zero all the way to you're reading the Tanakh, the, the Hebrew that's, Bible. That's amazing. That's, that's really cool. So, t so David, tell us about that. We've done this before, but for the people who are new to the program, what is the SBL and what's the SBL annual meeting? So the Society of Biblical Literature has probably been around 100 years or more. Uh, it's, a, it's the academic meeting for biblical studies. So it's where mostly professors in seminaries and universities give papers about their research. And it really, you might think, oh, that's just going to be a small little conference maybe like at a small community college or something, right? And then all of a sudden, when it's combined with the American Academy of Religion Conference, all of a sudden there's 10,000 people there. So, so every year we go to these cities and it's the gigantic conference centers. You could like land airplanes in these places. Um, that's how big they are. So it's a huge- Yeah, we conference. don't want people to do that though. <laughs> Right, no, that's not, that's not what we're, we're, we're pro to hear. Um, but it's, it really is, there's a lot for everyone to find the talks that they want to listen to. Mm -hmm. There's really a lot of options. So I, I actually uh, wrote an article uh, last year now, or uh, now in 2023. Uh, and we're talking this year about SBL 2022, which it takes place every week, every year, the week of Thanksgiving, which is a really interesting choice. I think it's because the professors who are teaching in universities get off from uh, like they have vacation where they get off from school. But I've spoken to people overseas. They're like, it's the middle of the semester. I can't just take off my teaching responsibilities and fly over to like Denver or, or San Antonio or wherever they have it. So, so there's also something with the international SBL, which is in Europe usually. Um, right. There, yeah, might so be, there might be more plain reasons for that. Nehemia, is, you know, it costs yeah. a lot less to have a conference just a few days before Thanksgiving. Oh, um, does it? You know, yeah. Why? So it might be, there might just be a, a, a practical reason too. Ah, um, okay. Fair so, enough. Yeah. So, so I actually wrote a paper this last year, uh, um, not for SBL, for a, a conference I did in Budapest. And in the paper, I was citing an article in the Journal of Biblical Literature, which is the journal of SBL. And, um, and just, just to give people an idea of what we're talking about. So in biblical studies and the academic, uh, arena of biblical studies, this is like the Super Bowl or the world series. This is like where anybody who's anybody, the, t uh, cream of the crop come and they give lectures. So in 1905, someone gave a lecture at SBL that I cited, it, or I should say he cited the lecture in his journal of biblical literature paper. He said, somebody gave comments. And they gave new information he didn't have, so he cited it. So I was curious, okay, when did he actually give the lecture, right? Because it was published in, like, I want to say 1905, 1906. So when was the actual day of the lecture? So I was able to trace the exact day of the lecture, and, and I found the itinerary of SBL from 1905, and there were, like, 10 lectures or something, the entire SBL, which That's is hilarious true. because— Where was it? Uh, it was in New York. In New York, the Union Theological I think it was Assembly, at Columbia. No, I think it was at Columbia University. I'm which is mistaken. combined with Union, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So I, I think that's hilarious because, um, because now you go to a session and there's four or five lectures per session. And right. there's hundreds and hundreds of sessions. There's, I don't know, thousands of lectures probably. Right. 
and, and we, the hard yeah. part, Nehemi, is finding yeah. the good ones. And that's what I think we'll talk about today is some of the good ones that we found. Right. Uh, well, I wanna, ones, yeah, I want to do a reactions because nobody, even the people who go can't, can't hear all the lectures. And so between us, between the three of us, I don't know, did we go to 30 or 40 lectures? I don't even know, right? Let's say I went to 10 a day and there were three main days and a couple side days. So I want to call it 40 lectures I went to, something like that. Um, I, was, I was probably 25, 30. Okay. All right. Uh, Nelson, how many do you think you went to? I think I was about 30, 30 to 35 also. Okay. And can I just say something about yeah, the way please. Rabbi Dr. David Moster introduced and described the SBL? So my first SBL experience was last year in San Antonio. Now, they had canceled, SBL had canceled the annual meeting in 2020 because of COVID. So right. in 2021 in San Antonio, it was the first time they did it since 2020 and they were getting back in the swing of things. And so my first SBL experience was, was I feel like, Denver 2022 was my first real experience right. yeah. to see all yeah. the people getting to attend all these lectures, trying to decide what, you know, what, what I want to, it's like, you know, choosing who's your favorite parent. Do I, do I want to go right. to this one? Do I want to go to that one? Oh, this right. person is speaking at that one. Oh, but I don't want to miss this one because this, they have this person speaking, this professor, this doctor speaking and, and to be among the crowd, to be among the people, uh, to, to, to be amongst people who are, having to make the same decisions you are and deciding what lectures to go to, which ones to forego. I mean, to me, I felt like this was the real SBL experience. Not that I'm 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 putting down what happened in San, uh, 2021 in San Antonio, but right. this felt like, wow, this is my first SBL experience. Yeah, because 2021, they had half of it was still on Zoom. So Exactly. Right. So this was yeah, a real... Yeah. It was funny. In, tw in 2020, there were like so many people there. It was online. And it was like... You'd have a lecture and there was like, I don't know, 40 or 50 people there, which in let's, you know, we do, I do Masoretic studies mostly, which is the manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible. And you'll, if you've got 20 people, that's a good turnout, right? Uh, and there were like suddenly 40 people because, hey, it's really easy to go if it's online. And then 2021 was the opposite. It was like, there was like four people there. <laughs> right. And, right. And then, so in 2020, 2020, there was this huge number of people, but it was all online. And it wasn't the real experience like it was in 2021. That, that was, uh, or in 2022 rather, and in years before that. Even this year, I would say there was significantly fewer people than there was like, I don't know, in 2017 or 2018. But it was, it was a good turnout. Yeah, I agree. It was, there was less, but it was still like big. Like, oh, it yeah, was, for sure. there were, like, the, like the, the book fair was full. Well, yeah, we didn't mention the book fair. So tell them about the book sale. fair, David. Yeah, th this book sale is um, it's a it's a world class book sale. Every kind of publisher in biblical studies, or most of them, come and set up a booth, and it could be any area of biblical studies. It could be, let's say, Eastern Orthodox liturgy. Boom, you have a booth. If you want Jewish rabbinics, boom, you have a booth. If you want, let's say, the SBL, they have their own printing company. Um, you know, there's there's so many different printing presses. Uh, in biblical studies. So right. you can really just in one room do a whole lot of shopping. In, so, in a, yeah. so in, in a, 2017, in a, I went to an SBL in, um, in Helsinki, in uh, Finland, the international SBL. And that's where there were people there from like Hong Kong. There were people there from like, you know, South Asia, from India, uh, a lot from Israel. Uh, and so they had a, a book fair there too. And it was one little hall in the university where they were holding it. And like, wow, it blew my mind because in uh, the annual SBL in the U.S., there are dozens and dozens of, of, of little kiosks. I, so I want to share the most interesting book I saw because I walked around uh, two or three times around the um, SBL um, uh, exhibition where they're selling all these books. And people have, like, the, the, look, these companies have to pay. So not everybody's there, right? Um, and in 2021, there was very little because they're like, why should we pay? Nobody's going to be here. And they weren't entirely wrong. Um, but this, this 2022, there are a lot of book, book um, kiosks. And so the most interesting one I saw, it was a, a book called, I don't remember who the publisher was, but it was a book called first century Judaism and 21st century Africa. And it was about uh, people in, in, I want to say Mozambique, but don't hold me to it, who were trying to follow the new Testament based on their understanding of what a first century Jew would have 
observed as a follower of Jesus. It was really interesting. Yeah. Um, like that was not a book I would expect to find. And then you also have things like on the Quran, you have, oh, yeah. um, yeah. When, what, one year I saw there a table for the council on foreign relations. Um, and I thought, wait, I didn't know that was a real thing. I thought that was just a thing from conspiracy theories that my friends who watch Alex Jones, like talk about. And so I went to one of their lectures and it was like radical left-wing propaganda. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, but it's a real thing. And I don't know yeah, if that's what it always was, this particular one. Uh, I've never heard of it. Um, but this you never right. heard of it? So I think you bring up, there's the, the AAR, yeah. the American Academy of Religion. So there's Buddhism, there's, uh, there's Islam, there's a, whole, there's a whole list of, of religious groups also, not just biblical studies. Yeah. Yeah, I once went to one at the American, a lecture at the American Academy of Religion, uh, one of their sessions, and it was about, um, about white nationalism which is another way of saying like neo-Nazis, <laughs> but like for some reason, nobody wanted to say that. And um, they're like, oh, you know, we should study whiteness, how it marks bodies. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> what? You actually I don't even know what you guys you, are talking about. You actually said this or you just thought this? No, th I did I mean, say this. Well, I, I actually took one of the people who spoke out to, um, to lunch and I'm like, I don't understand. What do you mean it marks bodies? Like what? Like what is it? What does it? What does it even mean? I, I I don't. And I think what they're doing is they're taking terms from like, um, like African American studies, and they're trying to apply them. But what does it even mean in African American studies? I I, I really don't understand what like their term. Like so, what I think they've done. And look, we do this in a lot of fields. We develop this whole jargon. This this we develop certain terms. Right. Instead of saying I was, I was talking to somebody just yesterday uh, and uh, I said, so what do you do? And she said, oh, I study blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what's that? She's like, I thought you have a doctorate. You don't know what that is. I said, I, I bet. And this was something in like microbiology. I said, I'm pretty sure you don't know what a hapax legomenon is. Um, now, I could have just said a unique word in the Bible. It doesn't appear anywhere else. Right. But we developed these terms. I don't know why to make us sound more interesting. To um, maybe be more precise, but then it tends to be less precise. I don't know. Um, so we have this jargon where 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 we have these these terms that refer to very specific things. That if you're not part of the field, you would have no idea what it was. By the way, it was PCBs she studies, and I said to her, "So what are PCBs?" She said, "I don't know. I thought you would know." She's like, "I study them, but I don't know what it stands for." And I'm like, "It's got to be polycarbonate something." And it was. It was. I don't know what the B was, but. Um, so, so the point is, um, they develop this like unique terminology where only they can understand what they're talking about. One of the beauties of what we can do here, of what I try to do in Hebrew Voices, is to cut through the jargon and try to explain to somebody who isn't part of this field, who hasn't been indoctrinated into all the terminology, what on earth are we talking about that would be interesting and important for them. So on that note, David, I'm going to ask you, what was the most interesting lecture that you went to? All right. So the most interesting lecture that I went to was in the historical geography section, which um, mm -hmm. I actually started up with a friend, Chris McKinney. And the, the talk was by, I have here all the details. It was by Lawson Stone from Asbury Theological Seminary. And Asbury Theological is, I believe, in Kentucky. And Lawson was able to bring in his knowledge of horses into his interpretation um because his knowledge he, of what courses like university courses no h-o-r-s-e -E. oh horses horse. nay nay horses is like not. the dothraki and the tons okay right so if you if you allow me i know not everyone here is going to be watching but um if you'll allow me to just share my screen for a moment here yeah um what i have for you here is uh what I have for you here is two verses in Joshua 11. In the 11th chapter of Joshua, God tells Joshua that he, Joshua, and the Israelites are going to conquer the king and the confederation of Hazor, which in English you might want to pronounce as Hazor or something like that. Hazor. Hazor, maybe. Hazor, but in Hebrew it's mm -hmm. going to be Hazor. Yeah. And there's this really fascinating passage uh, that comes up that uh, – 
that Lawson spoke about. And it's right here, this word te'aker. So in the Hebrew word is te'aker, I have to highlight it. And God says, et susehem te'aker, their, voice, their horses, you are going to aker. What does it mean to aker? And all the translations um, either have to hamstring or to hew, which I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the hew right, but or um, what that means is to hamstring. That's in the King James. But everyone after the King James has to hamstring, to hamstring, to hamstring. And what that means is that you take the horse, you chop it at the Achilles tendon, and then it can no longer run. Mm. Okay. And so basically what, what Lawson asked was, first of all, why would you do this? Why would you hamstring a horse? It's just going to die. A horse that can't move is going to die. Why are you going to have thousands of horse dying? That's the first question. The second question he asked is like, wait, aren't horses valuable? And he's right. If you actually look at different biblical texts, the value of a horse is considered more than the value of a man. So like a, a horse would be very valuable. What's going on? And then finally, isn't it just mean and cruel to like kill these animals by chopping off their their um, their tendons? If you wanted to kill the horse, you should just chop it at its at its neck. Be kind, you know. Don't kill these horses all all, all at once. Mm -hmm. So those are the questions. Okay. So yeah. what what so Lawson? What his answer was is that everyone's misunderstanding the word care. It doesn't mean to hamstring. Um, as it actually comes from the root of Akara, a barren woman, and okay. Akar, a barren man. What you're doing is you're making the horse barren. You are um, you are castrating the horse. So all of a sudden now, you're not killing the horse. You're castrating the male horses. And the idea being is, he says he's not 100% sure, but his idea being is that the 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 castrated horses are going to be a lot less wild and you know valuable to a warrior you're basically defunding or, or decapacitating the military horse that's basically what you're doing you're making this horse from a weapon into maybe to help you plow your field and then all of a sudden you're not killing the horses you're not being cruel to the animal excessively and you're making sense of this root a car it means by itself it means to be to uproot, like you uproot a, a, a root, you know, right. uprooting a root. You're you're a barren person. You're uprooted. You're castrated. So that was the talk that I thought was the most interesting and um, self-contained. And hopefully, you and and Nelson and the viewers uh, could benefit from from that one. So now I'm really interested to see how this is interpreted, um, because uh, let's see, yeah. So. Um, uh, uh, uh. Ah, interesting. So here uh, I'm looking at the, the, you know, there's a website dot.ac.il. Here, I'll share my screen. So here uh, there's this website, Shvilei Tanach, and it has different um, interpretations, different classical rabbinical commentators. And here, Malbim, uh, he says, uh, that Israel will not rely on them in their wars. Uh, and the king has already been commanded not to multiply horses. So the implication here is he understands ta'kev as to uh, neuter and make or, it so they can't reproduce. Or to hamstring and then they die. No, but why balir belo susim? You shouldn't multiply horses. Right. So, I mean, it's still not clear. I don't it, know if anybody's ever suggested this, but like, it, it's, it's not clear It to seems me. to me that's Malbim's understanding, but I could be wrong. It, it, you're, you're right, it's not that clear. Um, but he should at least cite that as, as a parallel. Uh, sure. Or as a possible, um, maybe some maybe somebody said it before. Uh, but no, it's, it is interesting. Why would they always translate it as a hamstring when, when um, wait, let's see here. No, so most, most of the interpreters don't, don't say anything about it. But here's where we should look. So we have this other verse um, in Genesis. Uh, and you're right, it always means barren, or almost always means barren. Uh, Genesis 49, 6, and when pleased, they maim oxen. Uh, it's talking Name. about ubiltsanom uh, ikrusho, and here it's referring to, um, uh, this is, uh, isn't this Shimon and Levi, I believe, is the context here? And it's talking about how they, um, 
Yeah, Shimon and Levi, how they attack the city of Shechem. And then maybe there's a play on words with Shechem is the son of Hamor, which is donkey, and here it's Shoal, another domesticated animal that I'm not really sure. But let's see how they interpret Genesis 49 6, because that's going to be, because nobody, like Rashi, doesn't bother to interpret uh, or to say anything uh, to comment on uh, Joshua 11 6. Because it's obvious to him what it means. I guess it's not so obvious to us, though, right? Let's see, 49.6. Did I do this right? Let's go Rashi. Uh, uh, okay. Ratsula Akorot Yosef Shnikasho. Ah, they wanted to uproot Joseph, who's called the, the ox. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And then he says, Akru, and then he has a word here in French. Aha. Ishiroto Lichrot Gide Hashuk. Hashok. Gide Hashuk is right. To cut the uh, tendons of the shoulder of the um I don't what do you call that? You call the shoulder right, on, on an ox? Right, but these tendons that you're walking with. Right. Right, right. No, no, so you're right. So so Rashi interpreted it the way you're saying the standard interpretation in English is. Uh, then he gives yeah, a so, parallel, Joshua eleven nine. Uh, you shall hamstring their horses. Right. So you're right. That's how at least Ross so, interpreted so, it. So, so for me, the 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 thing I like the most about this talk, yeah, was that this was a person who actually works with horses, and I'm sure many of your listeners ah. say, "Hey, I I work with horses all the time." Not all the listeners, but like yeah. like personally, me, the most I've ever had with a horse is like when you go to the dude ranch and you go, you get, you get your one hour you know, circuit. And they're like, great. I had a great time with the horse, but like, I don't really know anything about horses. And yeah. so for somebody who raises a horse says, there's no point in hamstringing. You're just going to kill it. Um, this should be something else. And then the, the lexicography lines up really nice. So I wonder if there's a way to hurt the horse where it, where it, uh, it just can't be used in war, but it still could be used to plow a field. I, I don't know the first thing about horses. Um, Wait, well, remember for plowing, think about the, why do people maim, uh, castrate the bulls? And turn them into oxen. So they they're much more, you. right? They're much more docile. Yeah. And so it's the same kind of, the same kind of idea here that's going on in Joshua. So I was in Nepal. Uh, oh, uh, in 2014, I want to say, and uh, and and I saw these people plowing with a water buffalo, and I said, "Isn't that a wild animal?" They said, "Yeah, it would attack and kill you if you got too close to it, but it doesn't attack its its owners." Um, wow. And this had to do with them being Hindus, and so they wouldn't use, I guess they wouldn't use like a, a, an ox, but it's, it's like there's this, loop, this loophole, right? right? Where the water, the water buffalo, buffalo is not considered an, uh, a, a cow, so, so you're allowed right. to eat the flesh and, and, uh, and plow with right. it, because even though to me and you it's a cow, but right. to them it's, it's, you know, it's like a wild yeah, cow, I really right? understand the process of the loophole, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Um, so one thing to note about horses in the ancient world, I don't know if you mentioned this or if it's even important. So I asked this question when I studied archaeology for my undergrad. Why, why did they always have two horses or, or four horses or six horses in a chariot? And we think of knights and the cavalry as, as a single horse. Why do you need two horses? And the answer I was given is that, um, is that the horses weren't strong enough. So by the time you get to the Middle Ages, they've been breeding horses in Central Asia uh, ah. and Eastern Europe for, for centuries, for millennia. The yeah. Huns and the Mongols, they eventually breed these giant horses that can carry a knight. But in the Maybe. time of, um, of, of Joshua, in the time of even the Romans, generally the horses couldn't carry a, a soldier. They were too small. Yeah. And so you needed two of them, right? And then the classical roman thing is the quadriga the four horse chariot and uh i think in in if i remember correctly in, in uh, it's two horses in um in um in ancient egypt and then just a really interesting little tidbit why the 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 size of our cars and our roads are based on the roman roads and the size of the roman road is based on the two horse chariot and or two horse really wagon right cart um, and so, and, and then our modern trains are based on the same size. So the modern train is based on the size of two horses. Wow. So yeah, it's crazy that today in the 21st century, we still talk about horsepower and we still have roads that each lane right. is based on the size of two horses. 
So, and I guess it's two people as well, but um, specifically the Roman roads had to be two horses wide because the single horse generally couldn't carry, uh, couldn't pull a, a cart. But I guess other than that, I know nothing about horses. Um, right. So, all right, Nelson, uh, I've got some, a whole bunch of, of um, lectures that I went to that were absolutely fascinating. Before we get to Nelson, actually, um, David, what was your, the mo- did you see any interesting books at the book fair that you want to tell the audience about? What was the most interesting book you saw? Um, the most interesting book, uh, there's one that I ordered and still hasn't arrived, but the one that came, um, it was Jeffrey Kahn's introduction to, and this is the jargon you were talking about. This, uh-huh. I'll explain what this means. Introduction to the Tiberian Masoretic um, you know, pronunciation, the int- okay. that, that text, like what are the masteries? And what that basically means is for your listeners is when you actually open up an, a 1000 a, a year old text of the Bible, there's a lot more than the Bible you see there. There's a much, there's a lot more than just the Hebrew letters. So all that other stuff that's involved, um, that is the, uh, that is what he's writing about. And yeah. it helped me because actually I'm learning to change my pronunciation uh, I'm still, I'm, it's ever evolving, my Hebrew pronunciation, trying okay. to get as, as close to the way the, the Masoretes, the Tiberian Masoretes would have had. Um, and not everyone has to do that, but that's what I'm trying, trying to do. So, so on, by the way, that book is available as an open source book online for free? No, the other one. There's another one. Um, not the giant one. The okay. two volume one. The two volume one, yes. Ah, you're talking available. about the short little one. The little one, yeah. That's okay. the one I got. Because that's All not right. online, Come as on. far as I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's a good one, too. Yeah, but then he expands it in much greater detail. Um, in, in, uh, we'll put a link to that on the, web, on the, on the page for um, this episode. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, can, can I make a personal plug? Please. Actually, I forgot, to, I forgot to mention the most exciting thing at the book sale was my own um, biblical Hebrew reference cards that are finally coming out. And I'll, you know, I'll just share the screen for yeah. those of you who can see. Um, on here is on Amazon, the biblical Hebrew grammar card. And this is basically mm. everything I know about biblical Hebrew grammar. It's on an eight page fold out, like a menu. And, uh, if you want to study biblical Hebrew, this is really going to help you no matter what textbook you use, whether you use, whether you have a one-on-one teacher, whether, whether you have a, a grammar, this really is going to have every single major topic for you. And then the second card, um, that was at this book sale was that the biblical Hebrew vocabulary card, which Mm. is basically, um, which is basically uh, 1600 of the most common, of most common verbs and nouns in Hebrew. And this is what they actually look like. Nice. So I really recommend these to people. If you're trying to study biblical Hebrew, uh, it's really helpful instead of flipping through grammar books and like you have, it's almost like a cheat sheet. Or a, right. um, you know, when you look, when you study these languages, you use index cards, right? So you're just bringing right. this into the 21st century. I remember I right. had these handwritten index cards when I studied biblical Greek uh, and I had hundreds of them and, and it was, oh, it was painful. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that was, that was for sure the most exciting thing, hands down. Of course, yours me. is the most so, exciting thing. I, I for yeah. sure, uh, or I definitely, or I, I would say this, it's definitely the most useful thing. Right. Because because you might pick up the book on, um, I don't know, uh, uh, whatever book, um, you know, first century Christianity or first century uh, uh, religion and 21st century Africa. Fascinating book. But then as a practical guide for life or crack something you can use practically is really what I would say. This is much more practical. Right. If I'm studying the Hebrew and I'm looking. Oh, wait a minute. What what is the plural form? I don't remember. Does it you know how does it end? And, yeah. And what what's a yeah. PL and you know whatever uh, yeah. as I'm studying, or as somebody is studying who's you know beginner, um, it could be very useful. Um, yeah, and maybe and this, this, yeah, this was so. my COVID project, so it was really nice ah, to see yeah. it end because like we were talking about how <laughs> how like the field was like there was no conference, there was a half conference, and now we're back. Right. It was good for me like ah, see the COVID era stuff be finished. And now move on to the, nice. to the to, right to the after time. So, all right, I'm going to get to some of the lectures I went to, which are absolutely fascinating. But first, I'm going to get let Nelson go. Nelson, what was the most interesting lecture you went to besides mine, of course? 
course besides yours, Nehemi. Yeah, I'll have to go to my second most interesting lecture. Second but, most. Uh, yeah, mine too. Mine was the second <laughs> most. <laughs> Thank you. But of course. So, so one of the most interesting lectures I attended was a lecture by uh, Professor Ohad Cohen. Uh -huh. uh, I've been taking a biblical Hebrew course based off of a curriculum that was created by this scholar, Ohad Cohen. And his lecture in particular was talking about a very interesting linguistic phenomena in the language of Aramaic, which is a sister language to Hebrew. So many of the listeners will know that, Nehemiah, you've talked quite a bit about the name of God, and you talked about his name, what it means, and where his name comes from. And you've taught that his name comes from a combination of three Hebrew verbs, haya, hove, yihia, he was, he is, he will be. And, I'm, and I want to speak specific, specifically about the last verb there, yihia, he will be. And it's spelled in Hebrew, yod he yod he And God's name is spelled yod he vav he So what was interesting about this lecture is he was talking about a phenomenon in Aramaic that is similar to he will be, ye he, except in Aramaic, it's spelled yod he vav he So in the Aramaic language, the third person masculine singular verb, he will be, is spelled exactly like the four letter name of God. Now, the thing he was talking about is in the Persian period of Judea, in Judea, the time of Ezra, the time of uh, Nehemiah, during the Persian period, when they have come back from Persia, mm -hmm. they've been allowed to come back to their homeland, they've rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And so we're talking about the Persian period during this time. And what you find is within Ostraca, which are writing on pieces of potsherd, and, and even in the Hebrew Bible, you see that in Judea, which was uh, where Aramaic was the administrative language and the lingua franca of the entire Near East at that time, you find that the, the, the Judeans seem to have a problem with that particular Aramaic word, uh, spelling it yod he vav he And the way they would spell it, they would spell it lamid uh, he vav he and I want to bring an example. You two have shared your screen. I want to share my screen here. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to go to the book of uh, Daniel. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. So I have up here accordance, and I have up here three panels. I have up here on the left, the Hebrew Bible, and then I have two English translations on the right, NASB and the JPS. And so here, uh, this particular verse, this is Daniel 4.22, as you can see, 4.25 in um, the Christian layout of the Bible. Um, here, this is this is the verse that's in Aramaic. This is Daniel. This is Daniel describing a dream that the, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had. And here, I'll read it from the I'll read it from the JPS over here. This is Daniel 4:22, 4:25 in English, uh, the English layout. Uh, it said, "You will be driven away from men and have your habitation with the beasts of the field. You will be fed grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven." Seven seasons will pass over you until you come to know that the Most High is sovereign over the realm of man, and he gives it to whom he wishes. Okay? And so here, you can see here, one of the words Daniel uses is the word leheve. And it's here, uh, it says, ve'im chevat bara leheve medorach. And with the beasts of the field will be your habitation. So here the verb uh, is being used with habitation. Your habitation will be lecheve, and so even though this is Aramaic, this is a uh, one of the things Ohad Cohen was talking about was this is a very interesting phenomenon you see with how the Judeans in Jerusalem use this verb. They spell it as you can see here, lamed yeah. he vav he, and it's usually spelled yod he vav he. Now, of course, I'm talking about just the consonants, not taking the vowels into consideration, but right. just on the surface, the spelling. Lamid he vav he conflicts with the typical Aramaic spelling of yod he vav he. And so what his his lecture was about was, so scholars have tried for centuries, and, and there's still very recent scholarship on the subject. Tried, they've tried to answer the question, why is this verb spelled with a lamid ex, uh, instead of with a yod, as it usually is in Aramaic? And so he talked about a number of the explanations scholars have given through the through the decades. But what he noted was that none of their explanations came from a historical perspective. 
So his lecture was laying out from his from uh, uh, from his research and his scholarship what is the historical reason for why the Judeans did not spell it Yod Hey Vav Hey? And it, it may see, seem obvious why, but it was really interesting to hear his his description and his layout of what was going on in the history of, 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 J- of Jerusalem during the Persian period. He talked about the, the melting pot, the Canaanite melting pot with the Judeans and the, the Edomians, which is just the, the, the Latin way of saying Edomites, and the Canaanites who were to the north and to their west on the coast. And he described how one of the reasons why this may about was a combination of things. Possibly, one, this idea about taboo uh, with writing the name of God uh, when it was not specifically a reference to the God of Israel. And three, and second, uh, probably having to do with this mixing pot, this mixing pot with the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, mixing with the Edomians, because he noted that you see this verb used by the Jews in Elephantine, and the Jews in Elephantine were Jews who had migrated to Egypt uh, during, we could say, the, the period of uh, Second Kings, right? They migrated to a, a region within Egypt, and on their ostracon, on their writings, the ones that are still extant, they they write out this verb yod he vav he. So he proposed maybe it was a combination of things, not just with taboo, but also a combination of the Canaanite mixing pot. And we also see this. He he noted that he noted something that scholars don't note, which is he brought the book of Nehemiah. So I'll go over here to another uh, tab, and I'll read this from uh, Nehemiah. Uh, this is Nehemiah 20, uh, 13, 23, and 24. And I'll read from the JPS version here. It says, also at that time, Nehemiah speaking, I saw that Jews had married uh, Ashdodite, Ammonite, and Moabite women. A good number of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and the language of those various peoples, and they did not know how to speak Judean. Um, and it's interesting because he provided his own translation. And here he says that also at that time I saw that Jews had married. He doesn't use the word Jews, he uses the word Judeans. And I actually like that. I think that fits a little bit better um, talking about the specific inhabitants of, um, uh, of Judea who have come back to what was the kingdom of Judah. So, so we see from Nehemiah that there is this mixing pot with other cultures other peoples. And this, this of course, is what ultimately led to Ezra saying, no, 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 we, we, we can't have, we cannot have history repeat itself. Um, so you can go to the book of Ezra and read about what, 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 what he has the inhabitants do. But it was very interesting to hear somebody bring a historical perspective of why we see this phenomenon. Now, he, he admitted that, like, uh, like a good scholar should, I think, which is that he's not 100% that his suggestion or his theory was correct, because Nehemiah, you and I were there, and you even you even asked him a question about this verb specifically and how it conflicted with his theory about uh, there possibly being a taboo um, with writing the name that way. Um, but it was just very very interesting to hear somebody talk about this subject from a historical perspective. And the reason why I say that's interesting was because I think we're all friends with uh, Mr. Keith Johnson here. And one of the things Keith is always, always, always hammering is language, history, context, language, history, context. I wonder where he got that. (laughs) It was refreshing to hear somebody talk about the the history, the language and the context in a way that scholars before him may not have given as much attention to. So uh, I also had uh, uh, Ohad Cohen's lecture as one of my top uh, most interesting lectures. Um, I would say that he convinced me without any doubt that the exact opposite of what he was trying to argue. Um, and, and to me, the, the, the strong, so first of all, let's state, so look, I actually proposed this in like 1994 when I took a course at Hebrew university introduction to biblical Aramaic. And I learned about the form leheve, which should be by all rules of Semitic languages, Yeheve. And I said, oh, maybe they're maybe this is a disambiguation. Maybe they're trying to make the word sound different than the name of God. Maybe that's not not to say that Yudhevave was pronounced Yeheve, but that it's too close for comfort. That's what I suggested. Um, and so you know we say Lamaha Deval Dome, what's to, what is a similar thing? So uh, in modern rabbinical Judaism and Orthodox Judaism, they don't even say Elohim, they say Elohim. And they won't say El, they'll say Kale. 
uh, to refer to God, right? El is the short form and, of Elohim. And and Nehemiah, how do you write the number fifteen? What should it be? And what do people write? Ah, uh, so I think that's different. So the number fifteen should be Yud Hey, but they write Tet Vav, so it should be ten Yud-Hey plus five. Yeah, name of God. So I think right? they do that, so it's not confused with with the name of God. Well, so, isn't that what? That's no, what, here, um, here, oh. here we're talking about pronunciation. You're talking about right. writing. Yeah. The um, letter they know. The letter. Also, yeah. if you write Yudhe as a number, and I found text manuscripts where they write Yudhe as a number, but it creates an ambiguity, whereas Tet Vav, which is nine plus six, right? I mean, it brings you 15. Um, so it's, it's an ambiguity there. Um, so here I think it's different. So the example I was going to give, and tell me if you ever heard this, David. So I grew up with Jews, ultra Orthodox Jews who instead of saying ginger ale, they would, no joke, they would say ginger kale because ale is the Hebrew word for God. And they wouldn't say ale unless they were reading a Hebrew text in the synagogue in a formal context. So, so they said, oh, you know, we know ale and ginger ale isn't the name of God, but it's too close for comfort. So we're going to say ginger kale. So my suggestion with that background was, ah, maybe they said leheve instead of yeheve. Yehaveh, because it's too similar to the name of God. And the professor said, absolutely not. And here's how we know. If you look at other dialects of Aramaic, the Lamed of Leheveh is there in words that have nothing to do with Yudhe So for example, in, in Talmudic Aramaic, uh, he will say is Lema, right? So why isn't it, why isn't it uh, Yema, which is short for Yema, right? They, it's the way they pronounced it. Uh, maybe they had a rhotic R. I'm not really sure. Um, so, uh, so uh, Yemar becomes Yema, which is then pronounced Lema in, in in Babylonian Aramaic. So there, you're saying it has something to do with Yud Hey Obviously not. So Ohad Cohen addressed that in his lecture. He said, "Oh, that's 800 years later. I'm talking about in the Persian period. Yeah, but it's a phenomenon in the same language that survived, right? I mean, give me a break. Um, and then if you look at um, and by the way, the whole background for this, for those who don't know Semitic languages, is that in the future form, or what's sometimes called the, the prefix form, or the, or the uh, imperfect form, uh, or the imperfect tense, or mode, uh, you have these four prefixes, Aleph, Yud, Tav, Nun, which are prefixed to the verb in the future form. So when, if you add an Aleph, it means I will. If you add a Tav, it's you will, or she will. If you had a nun, it's we will. And the yud that we're talking about is he will. And the point is that in Babylonian Aramaic, the yud is replaced with a lamid, even though in other Semitic languages it's a yud. And that's not unique. In Syriac Aramaic, it's replaced with a nun. And how do we get the in Syriac Aramaic wasn't spoken by Jews. This was the Aramaic of the Gentiles of Emesa or Homs in modern in, in today modern Syria, northern Syria. Um and where do you, so the, so in air, uh, in Syriac, they would say something like, and I don't know the vowels, but it'd be something like Nehewe or Neheve. So where does the nun come from? Uh, and that's for all verbs, not just he will be. So where does the nun come? It comes from, we have four letters that switch between them. Lam la, Lamid Mem Nun Resh. So the nun in, in uh, Syriac Aramaic is related to the Lamid in Babylonian Aramaic. It's, it's the same letter essentially pronounced differently. Um, based on their, you know, their dialect, la, na. Uh, it's very common in, in many languages, not just Semitic languages. Um, and and so, so I think that, so he brought up a fascinating argument, which I've suggested myself decades ago, not in as uh, um, erudite and scholarly a way as he did in this lecture, but he convinced me of the opposite. And the strongest proof against his argument, and he brought this evidence. I was looking for the slide just now on my phone. I couldn't find it. Uh, I thought I took a photo of it. Um, but he brings examples in Edomite Aramaic where you have the name or an Edomite, let's say, right? Uh, cause it's a name and you'll have someone named after, you know, we have names that begin Yeho, Yehonatan or, uh, and he ha- and they have names there with the word Kos. Kos is the name of the Edomite God. And in there, if there's a verb, and I don't remember the exact example, but there are verbs that are combined in the name, right? It's called, you've got theophoric element Kos just like we would have Yeho. And then they have like Yiten, right? But it's not Liten, it's, li, it's Liten with a Lamed. So what are you telling me? They're trying to disambiguate the word Natan 
or whatever the word was. I don't remember. Maybe it was lakach. I don't remember the exact example. But it was a lamed in place of the yud of the Eitan letters in a name in their dialect of Aramaic. Or, I, mean, I shouldn't I say the dialect. I, of, I shouldn't say the dialect of Aramaic in the in the Edomite language because it's a name, so I don't know what language it is. Could be just Edomite. Yeah, what do you have the example, Nelson? I do. I, I believe I Can have this. Can I share my screen? Yeah, yes, please. Sir. Oh, this is exciting. Let's oh see. God, is this is the so one. Exciting. Let's see it. All right. So, oh, this is beautiful. So he he calls Yaktel plus divine name, right? So Yaktel is is the letters Kuf Tav Lamed or Tet Lamed. Of the, of the root, that's how scholars write a generic form, and the yud is the prefix, which means he will. So have ya, and, and by the way, these vowels, ignore my vowels here, because I have no idea what the vowels are in a name that was written, you know, thousands of years ago that isn't written with vowels. Ya'adriel, Yakneel, Yishmael, well, Yishmael we're pretty sure of, because we have that name in the Bible. Yitiel, Yirmiyahu, right? So the yud is he will, and then all of a sudden we have kos ya'ate, kos will bring, kos yevarech, or maybe it's kos yibrach, right? I don't, I obviously don't know, right? Kos will bless, kos dili. So these are examples where it has the yud. And then he has other examples where the yud swapped out with the lamed. Instead of ya'adriel, he has la'adriel, lansirael, kos la'alef. Kos la'alef is an interesting word. It means something like coast will be coast being the God will be strong or maybe coast will train or something like that. Coast will be mighty. Coast lita. I don't know what lita is. Do you know what that is? Uh, uh, I don't know that word off the top of my head. Uh, yud tav ayin. Or maybe it's just a word in Edomite that I don't know. Coast uh, linhar, which is probably coast will give light. Coast so Coast will give uh, uh, brightness so will, or will guard rather. Coast uh, laaz. Coast will be mighty. Kos La'akov. That's beautiful. So it's the name Jacob combined with Kos. And it's not Ya'akov. It's La'akov. Because there's something in these Semitic languages where the Yud gets swapped out with a Lamed in uh, Babylonian Aramaic and an Edomite. And here I don't know that we can say necessarily Edomite Aramaic because it's a name, right? Um, but it's an Edomite dialect. And then in, uh, and then in the and then in Syriac Aramaic, it's swapped out with the Nun, which is a related, related implementation to the Lamed. So this, to me, definitively proves that Lehebe has nothing to do with yud heh vav -Heh. It's just something that happens in these Semitic languages where the Lamed prefix replaces the Yud. What do you think, David? I, I think it's probably both. You I, like, it, I think it's probably both. I think what you're saying makes a, a whole lot of sense. This is just a regular phenomenon yeah. of a language. But like, I don't really see a lot of scribes writing yod hey vav hey. Um, ah, so, you know, so the uh, it might be a scribal thing too. So Okay, possible. Any, uh, scribal I'm, or language. I just don't, you know, it's, it's probably both. That's okay. my guess. And I'm, but I don't know, this is all new to me, this, this, uh, so, this Edomite so, stuff. So uh, in another lex lecture by Esther Eschel, which is in the same session, she had these uh, mo uh, Edomite uh, ostraca, which are pieces of pottery, where people would write on the pottery because paper was expensive and parchment was expensive. And it had yud heh vav -Hey. And it was clear in the context, it means he will be. It had nothing to do with the name of God. Right, so... So right. there are some people who did write it, but you're saying a Jewish scribe would be hesitant Maybe. to write Yudhe Vav. But here's the thing, uh, David, he could have write Yud, he could have written Yudhe Vav Aleph. Right. This, right. The Lamed. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's not right. I'm not I'm not gonna this I'm not gonna die on this hill if you're asking me. Like I don't think it's it's very right. clear either way. But um, you know, we, we could talk about scribes. Like if someone's writing a letter. Um, or like a contract in the middle of the, the Judean desert. That's one thing. But like, let's say you're in Jerusalem um, and you're writing the book of Daniel for the, for the temple court. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, maybe you would. So um, just, just okay. like, I see both as possible. I like, yeah. I like both. That's, that's my thought. Okay. All right. Anyway, it was, it was a beautiful lecture that he gave and it was a good lecture. I just think he convinced me of the opposite. Um, and look, I, I would like it to be right. It, it's a very attractive uh, argument to say that there was this disambiguation as a way of expressing sanctity for the name. My background here, by the way, uh, uh, has, uh, you, you can see the yud heh vav -Hey is an, an Elohim, are in a different shade of ink. This is a 13th century Ashkenazi Torah scroll. 
if I move aside, you could see it, uh, some better way, examples. And no, I think, no, no. So here for, uh, it's always backwards on, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's backwards on. Yeah, Zoom. so move, move your other way. Good. No, other direction. Good. Now we can see it. All right, no, but you can see another example here to, next to my shoulder. Uh, on the second to last line, Yudhe Vav Hey Elohim. It's a yeah. different shade of, of ink. And here there's no, and this is a 13th century uh, Northern Europe. It's a different story, a town called Erfurt. Here they are clearly wanted to show sanctity and, and reverence for the name. So, so they left a blank space and filled it in afterwards with a different batch of ink. And over the centuries, the inks became a different color. Originally, they were probably the same color. Um, so it's very attractive to me, this idea that, oh, they wanted to show that the letters, yud heh vav -Hey, even when they don't refer to the name of God, that they had this meeting. But you have all these names that have the Lamed in them, and, 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 the, and the names have nothing to do with, with yud heh vav -Hey, right? It's, it's, you know, kos la az, kos will be powerful, I mean, or will be mighty, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not convinced, I'm convinced more ever now of the opposite, but... but I, I You'll, you'll rename uh, the podcast Edomite Voices of, you know, of pronunciation instead of Hebrew. No, but why is this relevant for Hebrew voices? Because, because Hebrew is a Semitic language, and, and you got to look at the other Semitic languages for sure. to learn yeah. things about ancient Hebrew. Um, no, for sure. So, I, I think you're, you're right on with that. But I want to share some of the most exciting lectures that I went to. So one of the most interesting lectures I went to was by this uh, Christian... Um, this Israeli Christian or Danish Christian who lives in Israel, and he did a systematic survey of Messianic Jews in Israel. And this was really interesting to me because I've been hearing for decades about, you know, there's all these Messianic Jews all over. Israel. So many people are coming to belief in, in Yeshua is the way it's always presented. And, 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 I, and I don't ever know what the real numbers are, right? It's really hard to know. And, he, and I think this was his approach. He's like, okay, how many are there actually in Israel? So, all right, guys, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Rabbi Dr. David Mostert. Uh, David, what's your website? My website is biblicalculture.org. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in studying biblical Hebrew, um, my courses are every few months, every six months at the current point. So um, if, whenever you hear this, within a few months, if you're interested in, in mm -hmm. taking a year-long course, we're going we're gonna to go. So Beautiful. you're more than welcome to join. And thank you, Nelson, of the Institute of Hebrew Bible Manuscript Research. Hello. Shalom. Hello, gentlemen. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.